This flight is happening now. Not in peacetime, not during a phase of technological demonstration. Russia is at war. Economic pressure is ongoing alongside military pressure. The defense industry is operating under constant strain. In situations like this, simplification is usually the norm. Non-essential programs are halted. Long-term projects are postponed. Funding is redirected toward needs with immediate battlefield impact. That is the usual pattern. And precisely because of that, the decision to continue testing the Su-57 with a new engine becomes significant. Isdalier 177 did not emerge in a vacuum. It appeared under real pressure, under operational necessity, under constraint. This engine is not being tested for brochures, not for air shows, not for short-lived headlines. It is being tested because a gap exists, a need for longer endurance in the air, a need for improved efficiency in extended operations, a need for a platform no longer dependent on interim solutions. In combat aviation, the engine is the foundation. Without a final engine, all other capabilities remain theoretical. Radars can be advanced, sensors can be sensitive, weapons can be modern, but without a stable and mature engine, all of it is constrained by time, range, and risk. This flight does not claim that the Su-57 is perfect. It communicates something more important, that Russia is attempting to close a transitional phase, not through grand declarations, but through concrete steps. They are not announcing technological victory. They are locking in direction, and that distinction matters. For years, criticism of the Su-57 has been fairly consistent, and much of it has been valid. The aircraft has often been described as immature, incomplete, caught between development stages. The most frequently cited issue has almost always been the same, the engine. The initial engines were sufficient for flight testing, sufficient for limited production, sufficient to keep the program alive, but they were not designed for sustained, high-pressure operational use. Russia has not truly denied this reality, nor has it concealed it behind inflated narratives. Instead, it chose a phased approach, not a fast approach, not a spectacular one, and certainly not one designed to satisfy public expectations quickly. From the outside, this approach often appears slow. From within, it is controlled. Isdalier 177 arrives precisely at this point, not as a revolutionary leap, not as a paradigm shift. It functions as a gap closer. Thrust is increased, but not excessively. Efficiency improves, not dramatically, but consistently. Service life is extended, which in military aviation often matters more than headline numbers. This engine does not change the world. But it changes the aircraft's status from a transitional platform to a more stable one and that difference directly shapes how the aircraft is used, maintained and produced. An engine that is not yet final always carries consequences, not only technically but doctrinally. Aircraft powered by transitional engines are treated with caution. Flight hours are limited. Mission profiles are restricted. Risk exposure is minimized. Not because the aircraft is weak, but because its value is too high to gamble with. This shapes command level decision making. Not just what the aircraft can do, but when it should be used. With a more mature engine, that decision space widens, not making the aircraft more aggressive, but making it more flexible. It can remain airborne longer without major compromise. It can be planned into more complex scenarios. It can be relied upon without excessive oversight. These are changes rarely visible to the public, but deeply felt by operators. And these changes form the bridge to understanding how the Su-57 is used in Ukraine.
many ask a simple question. If the Su-57 is a fifth-generation fighter, why is it rarely seen over Ukraine? That question begins with a flawed assumption. That frequency equals effectiveness. In modern doctrine, that is not always true. Ukraine represents a highly sensor-dense environment. Dense air defenses, dense real-time intelligence coverage. Deploying high-value assets routinely into such an environment is not courage. It is often unnecessary risk. The Su-57 is used selectively at specific ranges for specific missions. This approach is not a sign of weakness. It is risk management. The new engine does not alter this philosophy. It expands the options, not making the Su-57 more visible, but making it more relevant when employed. In modern warfare, relevance often matters more than visibility. Russia has begun expanding Su-57 production capacity. Such decisions are rarely made without strong justification. Production is not expanded when designs remain unstable, not when supply chains are fragile, not when a program's future is uncertain. This move signals that the Su-57 is projected as a medium-term platform, not a stopgap solution. Discussions of export are emerging openly. This is not about large volumes. It is about confidence. No nation offers a fifth-generation fighter without confidence in long-term support. Russia's approach differs from many of its competitors. It does not pursue rapid mass production. It prioritizes continuity. This approach may not appear impressive, but in prolonged conflict, it often proves resilient. And from here, the future operational role of the Su-57 becomes clearer. Based on its development trajectory, the Su-57 is not being prepared as a daily workhorse like fourth-generation fighters. Its direction is different. The aircraft is evolving toward a node role, not merely a shooter, but a coordination hub. In future conflicts, fighter aircraft no longer operate independently. They are connected to drones, to ground-based sensors, to air defense systems, to remote command structures. The Su-57 is being shaped for this environment, not to appear in every engagement, but to appear at decisive moments. The new engine reinforces this logic through more consistent endurance, greater mission flexibility, and reliability suited for system integration. In such scenarios, the Su-57 is more likely to operate beyond direct enemy air defense range, relying on sensors, on data, on long-range weapons, not visual dogfights, not close-range engagements, but control of battle space. This role does not produce dramatic footage. It rarely appears in frontline videos, yet it carries significant strategic weight. This perspective also explains why Russia does not rush to maximize Su-57 usage today. The aircraft is not being tested for yesterday's war, but for the next one, in the future, Su-57 operations may appear quieter less frequent, but more integrated, not as a symbol of power, but as an instrument of control. Ultimately, the Su-57 equipped with the Isdalia 177 engine is not a story of absolute superiority, nor is it a story of failure. It is a story of adaptation, of technology evolving under real pressure. The question is not who appears most advanced on paper, but who can adapt to reality. This is where the discussion becomes meaningful. Not to choose sides, not to justify war, but to understand how modern military power is actually shaped. This video is produced for analytical and educational purposes.
All discussions are based on open source information. It is not intended as propaganda or advocacy for conflict. If you hold a different perspective, present it with reasoned arguments. Healthy debate is always more valuable than one-sided conclusions.